Well, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining on another All Things Avenia. Uh, my name is Eli Travers. Today we're going to be talking about wine bottles. Uh, we just spent the last eight hours today bottling our 2019 vintage and our 2020 rosé here at Avenia. So we, it just felt appropriate to dig deeper and, and learn about wine bottles. Like why is wine in glass bottles? Where, where did that come from? Uh, and then also maybe something about how to store it correctly, how to handle it, um, and some tips for, for, for all of you. And then, of course, we'll do a little presentation first, and then there'll be some time for some questions and answers at the end. So wine bottles, history, science, and proper storage. So wine bottles. Now, Dean Schoenfeld over here mentioned Georgia, and that's the very first thing I'm going to talk about. So if you know me by now, you know I love history. I'm going to go over just a brief little history of glass bottles and wine vessels. So in the Caucasus Republic of Georgia back in 6000 BC, this is where winemaking really started. Um, at least not accidental winemaking, but actual wine winemaking for on purpose. Uh, and the, the first vessels that were used were these amazing things called kvevri. So if you're ever looking for a great Scrabble word, there's your word, kvevri, uh, spelled with a Q or K. These were earthenware vessels um, that were, they were actually buried in the ground. So there's huge clay, earthen clay uh, vessels. They were lined with beeswax uh, and they were either buried in the ground up to the neck or sort of just set into the floor of the winery. And they were used for everything. They were used for fermentation. They basically just scoop all the grapes in there, mash them up, let it ferment. It would age in that vessel and then they would store it in there until they were ready to drink it. So, and this is, they, they still actually use Kvevri in some winemaking today in Georgia. It's a pretty fascinating thing. And I'll show you a picture in a second. Uh, clay amphora, so what we think of as amphora in the Greek and Roman times were actually used by the Chinese first, which was pretty interesting to find out um, for many liquids. And then what we think of as the Greeks and Romans traveling around the Mediterranean Sea, they used these clay amphora uh, for storage and for shipping, for transport. Um, around the same time, there were glass bottles or there was glass containers that had wine in them, but they weren't strong enough to, for shipping and for transport. So this this part of the, the vessels is, is primarily about um, what they use to, to ship wine. Um, and then if you remember from our first week when we were talking about barrels, oak barrels uh, gained in popularity around 200 AD. And that sort of stayed uh, the course throughout most of history is that oak barrels is what we use uh, to ship and transport wine. And there's a picture. So up on the upper left, those are those kvevri, these huge earthenware pots that have that, that top. And then the bottom picture is actually, this is a current winery in the Kakheti region in, in Georgia, uh, where they're all buried into the ground. So all those circles on the floor are the tops of kvevri that have wine um, aging in them. And then on the right is your uh, clay amphora. So this is, these were these shipping clay vessels that the Romans and Greeks used um, to transport wine. Now glass, glass has been around um, almost as long. I mean, glass isn't necessarily a new thing. It's, it, they've discovered it or figured out how to make it back in 1500 BC. Um, and by the time they figured out how to blow glass, um, bottles were, were blown. And like I mentioned before um, with, with glass, but they were, uh, the glass was melted with wood fire. So it wasn't super strong. The glass wasn't strong enough to to um, be shipped or to really do anything other than just store or serve wine. Um, but there's still remnants. There's still the oldest unopened wine bottle in the world. There's a Guinness world record is a 1700 year old Roman bottle of wine. So glass was around the whole time. Um, but after the, the Rome fell, glass bottles sort of disappeared for a while during the dark ages, uh, but they came back in Northern Europe. So these are the Germanic people. Um, they actually called it forest glass for a while partially because these factories were in the woods of Northern Germany, but also these, the glass was a green color. They used wood ash uh, and things from the surrounding area to make their, their glass and it, and it turned green. Uh, and then later in the Middle Ages, um, people in Switzerland and Germany added manganese oxide, which gave us clear glass, which is great because then you could actually see what the liquid that was inside for the first time. And then the sort of the granddaddy of all glass master glass makers were the masters of Murano. This is a small island right off of Venice, part of the of Venice, where you had just the most famous most famous glass blowers in history. Um, and they're actually they're still 
professional or there's still Venetian trained glass blowers around. Actually, we Shelley and I saw one in Tacoma a few years back. His name is Lino Talia Pietra, and I think he's 85 years old, but he's one of the last living Venetian glass blowers from he's born in the island of Murano and he actually splits his time now between Seattle and Murano. Uh, but back, you know, back in 14th century, um, they were often bribed from other countries. So other places in Europe wanted this really good glass. They would try to bribe these glass uh, blowers to leave the island. And so instead, the Venetians were like, we'll let you marry into the noble family if you promise to stay and blow glass here. And it was only they were the only tradespeople that had that deal. So it really they gained this higher social status because of it. I just thought that was an interesting little tidbit. And then we get to the more industrial area. So by the 1600s, you had George Ravenscroft uh, who uh, developed or, or discovered lead crystal glass or flint glass. Um, and this was because we, they now were using coal-fired ovens. They got it a lot hotter, the, the glass was a lot stronger, a lot heavier. And this is when, at least in London, this uh, heavier glass was preferred to the Venetian glass, the really delicate glass. And then to sort of go across to see the, Ameri to the uh, Americans who started innovating and inventing things to, to make things a little faster. They invented this plunger mold that um, the first time they could actually mold bottles or mold vessels using a pretty a lever system. You had John Landis Mason, a tinsmith from New Jersey. If you if you recognize mason jars, that's who invented those. He was the first one to add a threaded finish. So this is where you were able to screw caps on top of bottles uh, instead of just corking it or sealing them with wax. And then you had a, a couple different um, in, innovations and inventions throughout the early 1900s to make things even bigger and bigger on a grander scale. You had the automatic glass forming machine. Uh, you had the individual section feeder and different innovations to, to shoot gobs of molten lava, not lava, molten glass through these machines in order to make bottles faster and faster. Um, so that now, by the, by the time we get to the end of the 20th, early 21st century, we're making 40 billion glass containers every year just in the US because of these machines. And you'll actually see the machine in a minute. So the basics of glass. Glass is made up of four main ingredients, if you think of it. Sand, which is uh, composed mainly of silica, um, makes up for about 45% usually. 15% um, soda ash or soda, soda carbonate, which helps melt the sand evenly. You have a proportion of limestone in there, crushed limestone, which can make uh, the finished glass more durable. And then cullet, which is is honestly just recycled glass. These are, it's any recycled glass crushed into a granular material or into pellets um, that they will use to boost their glass production. And the cullet is actually great for a lot of reasons. It helps uh, reduce cost of raw materials because you're always, you're recycling and using that, um, that glass that's already been made once. The fact that it's already been made once actually means you need less high temperature in your furnace for it to generate molten glass because it's already been through that process. Um, and they actually release less gases and CO2 um, that can form bubbles and imperfections in the glass. So using cullet is a really great thing. And a lot of, um, at least a lot of European countries have, have gotten to the point where they're, they're able to the, have recycling systems that they can get up almost 90% of their glass is recycled into more glass. It's a little harder in America, partially because distance. There's, it's hard to find gla re glass recycling plants in places that are close enough to glass manufacturers, manufacturers to, to warrant buying cullets and whatnot. Um, but that's, that's a whole nother, whole nother issue. Um, so you have these main ingredients, you put it all into a furnace, you heat it up to 2,730 degrees Fahrenheit, which takes quite a bit of time to get there. And then these, you know, it melts into this molten liquid glass and it's sent through a machine into bottle molds. And this is where I think it'd be interesting to watch a tiny little video.
so you kind of saw too the different sizes of bottles, different shapes. So that's what we're going to get into next is, is starting to talk about different sizes and shapes of bottles based on region. So wine bottle sizes, wine can come in everything. So all the way down to a piccolo or a split, which is your single serving. So that's one glass of champagne. You can imagine those really tiny bottles you'll see usually around the holidays, around New Year's. Um, you have your half bottle or demi. It's actually what I'm drinking from right now. This beautiful half bottle of 2016 Gravura here from Avenia. Your 750 milliliter standard bottle. That's what we all think of when we think of bottle sizes. Your Magnum you might be familiar with. And then we get into some of the large format stuff, which you'll notice have some pretty interesting namings. So Jeroboam, Rehoboam, Methuselah, Balthazar, Nebuchadnezzar, a lot of these are named after biblical kings or old Jewish kings or, or biblical prophets, other, other historical figures. And um, I, this was one of those things where you try to look up why, and no one really knows. There's not a lot written about why all of a sudden these large, large format bottles um, were being named after biblical kings. Uh, one story was that uh, um, it was actually Bordeaux, the Bordeaux region that labeled a bottle of Jeroboam, which was, is worth six bottles of a normal wine will fit into a Jeroboam or 4.5 liters. And that was, and there was a reason because it was such a, a rich Jewish king and, and it was so proper and they thought, we're gonna do a six bottle, um, a, a bottle that's six bottles worth and name it after something really fancy and rich. And so they named it Jeroboam. And then Champagne region was like, oh, that's cool. Let's do our own. And we'll name, we'll start naming large bottles after biblical kings too. Uh, and it kind of just kept on going. So you you have these um, these these bottles, Balthazar. You have Nebuchadnezzar, Solomon. I've actually seen a Balthazar bottle before. Uh, I worked when I lived in New York City. I worked at a restaurant called Balthazar in Soho, and we had one bottle of Balthazar champagne on the list. And no one ordered it when I worked there, but I did get to see it down in the cellar. I mean, and it's it's huge. And it's the kind of bottle where you need you need a couple people to to hold it to pour it into decanters so that you can actually serve it to a party. Um, but it doesn't stop there. You can get all the way up to uh, you have a, su a sovereign or a souverain bottle, uh, primats, which is equivalent to 36 bottles. And then you have your Midas uh, or Melchizedek, uh, which is 30 liters uh, in one bottle or 40 bottles. Now, the reality of, of most of these bottles, especially with Champagne Bordeaux, um, if it's above a magnum, then they're not they're not filled on a bottling line. <laughs> like these, these are usually um, ordered. They like people will pay for these bottles ahead of time. The wine rolls are like, all right, we need to make a Balthazar of this wine, and then they'll get as many bottles as they need to fill that Balthazar. They'll order the glass. They'll have it engraved, something really special, and then they'll basically funnel it into the large bottle and recork it. These aren't these are these are pretty rare bottles, but you will see them every now and then. Um, a lot of times you'll see them displayed in wine shops too. But now we'll get sort of into the basic. This is what you might recognize more is different shapes of bottles based on the regions or styles that they come from. So the big two or the, the ones you'll, you'll find most familiar are Bordeaux, Berg, or Bordeaux bottles and Burgundy bottles. Bordeaux, which originated in Bordeaux, imagine, um, which is the most popular shape of bottle in the world. This is like what I said here, the Gravura, this is a Bordeaux style bottle. It's your distinctive high shoulders, you know, straight down. Sometimes it'll be a little angular, but this is more or less the Bordeaux uh, shape. Now it's used for Bordeaux varieties or styles, bl blends. So Cabernet, Merlot, Malbecs, a lot of these grapes, no matter where they're grown now. So if it's an Argentina Malbec, usually it's in a bottle like this. If it's a Napa Merlot, it's usually in a bottle like this. Um, a lot of that is just tradition. There is the um, the idea that with Bordeaux varieties like Cabernet that age for a long time and that might throw sediment, that the shoulder will help pool the sediment when you decant. So when you do pour that um, that bottle, you can see through and it'll catch more sediment there, which will help you when you're decanting. That wasn't necessarily part of the original design. It wasn't the reason for the design. It was more of a a, a bonus. So after they realized oh, that actually works pretty great for, for decanting and we need to decant these wines. Um, but that was something I always thought that they was just, it was specifically designed for that purpose. And apparently it's not. 
Um, most of the Bordeaux varieties, and this is across the board, red wines will go in dark green glass, whereas your whites will be in a lighter green or even a clear glass. Most rosés are in clear glass as well, just because you want to show off that pretty color. But uh, the importance of dark green and the darker color glass is actually to protect the wine from light strike. So UV rays um, can cause this reaction. So vitamin, B's, uh, vitamin B can react with amino acids and produce sort of sulfury off flavors. If you ever th um, think, if you think of Heineken or some certain lagers and beer styles from Europe that are um, bottled in clear or really light green bottles, sometimes there's that skunky sulfury aroma. So a lot of times that's actually from light strike. That's actually a flaw in the beer. I think so certain producers have latched on to that as sort of a style now and they, that they market it that way. But that's why most beer bottles are brown is because brown or amber colored glass will filter out the UV light. You don't have to worry about light strike. So uh, burgundy bottles, I don't have one. I, I don't have one with me, but this is your gently sloping uh, bottle. I'll have a picture of it next. Uh, burgundy bottles were actually created slightly before um, the Bordeaux style and it has your graceful sloping shoulder. Um, the shape, the reason for the shape is actually just because it was easier for glass blowers to blow. There, there's, there's Robin has, is showing one now, thanks. <laughs> so this, it was just a natural shape for glass blowers. You didn't have to worry about shoulders or all these, these techniques that were a little trickier. Uh, and so that shape just stuck. And especially with Burgundy and Bordeaux, you know, they were rival regions for so long and still kind of are. So they both, as soon as they had a bottle and a style, it also became part of their identity and part of the marketing strategy is, you know, we have the high shoulder bottles, we have the graceful, maybe sexy bottles. And that's that's totally a part of the wine world too, is, is sometimes these decisions aren't about sediments, they're about, let's have a really cool marketing scheme. <laughs> um, so Burgundy bottles, this also remains the vessel for most Burgundy varieties. So Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, your Gamay Noir or Beaujolais, um, no matter where they're produced. Uh, and then uh, Rhone style wines are also in this bottle. I'm not really sure, and maybe I need to look up a little more about why Rhone uses the same um, the same general shape as Burgundy. It could be just because they are directly south, and a lot of the trading routes from Burgundy they had to go down the Rhone to get to the Mediterranean. Um, but I'm I'm not positive. But sometimes you'll have um, a stylized embossed neck on some of Rhone variety or Rhone bottles. Um, if you think of Chateauneuf to Pop, they have a, a papal crest. Uh, embossed in into the the neck to make it a little different and you'll you'll find variations too across the board as far as how high the shoulder or how high it slopes the angle um, but in general these are the the two main styles of bottles so on the left those are your Bordeaux style bottles and then your right is your burgundy or Rome style and then we get to Riesling bottles so these are your really tall slender your Schlegelflasche, if you're a German speaker, or drumstick bottle. Um, they're mostly associated with Riesling. Riesling is sort of the king grape in Germany, um, but also any of the wines from Alsace in France. So your Pinot Gris, your Gewürztraminer, even their Pinot Noir that they make in Alsace is usually bottled in the Riesling bottles or the Alsatian bottle. Uh, it's a more delicate glass. Um, and part of the reason they think that the, this style emerged for German wines and for Riesling is most of these wines weren't shipped overseas. They weren't going across the English Channel to England who were, who were buying the bulk of the wine in, in Europe. Um, they, they were just floating gently down the Rhine River. And so they didn't need to be as sturdy. They didn't need to be um, as, as big to, to last those that ocean voyage. Um, and so they were thinner glass, tall, slender, they could fit more of them across a, a boat's hull that was floating down the river. Um, whereas your Bordeaux and Burgundy were, were thicker and they were packed away and sent over the English Channel. Um, champagne bottle. So champagne, this was, this could, this could be a really long story. I'm going to, I'm going to try not to tell you the long story about champagne bottles. Um, cause that, I think sparkling wine could be a whole nother, another episode cause it's fascinating, but, um, it wasn't in, till the English, again, developed these, this coal-fired oven to make really strong glass, that champagne is what we know it as today. For a long time, champagne is a very northerly cold wine region. They would make their wines in the, in the fall. Um, they, they would think that fermentation was done because it would get so cold, fermentation would stop, so they'd bottle it. And then in the spring, it would start warming up again, 
and all that the the yeast and some of the sugars that were still left in the wine that they didn't realize were still there got, became alive again and started fermenting again and that's what caused bubbles in it's sort of this secondary fermentation it caused bubbles more co2 in the wine but because the glass was so weak these bottles would shatter so champagne winemakers would go down to their cellar and all of a sudden see all these bottles that were broken and they had no idea why it wasn't until the english who again were buying most champagne at this at this time realized that if they put the wine into stronger sturdier heavier glass it would keep the bubbles in there and you wouldn't lose all of your wine. You wouldn't lose your product that you could sell. <laughs> um, and then they started enjoying that fizzy, that fizzy flavor of wine. It, uh, for a long time, Champagne, ref they thought that bubbles was a flaw. They actually didn't want, they didn't intend to make sparkling wine. It wasn't until around the 16th, 17th century that they realized, oh, this is pretty special. Um, again, we can go into that at a, at a different way. Champagne is fascinating. Uh, but Champagne bottles, that's sort of where we got uh, those thicker, heavier, cold-fired oven glass. Um, they, again, usually have the gentle sloping shoulder, kind of like burgundy, and a very deep punt. We'll talk about punts in a minute. Um, usually light green in color, although you'll definitely see some clear bottles based on different brands and for some rosé. Um, and then, of course, for, for sparkling wine, they require pressurized uh, corks and cages to keep uh, the sparkling wine in the bottle. And then this is these are those two styles. So on the left is those that uh, Schlegelflasche, <laughs> your drumstick bottle they used for, for Rieslings, and then a whole bunch of different champagne-style bottles. And the last two um, are dessert wine bottles. So port bottles are interesting. Um, they do resemble a, a Bordeaux bottle, but you'll see a lot of them will have this bulb that sticks out in the neck. Uh, and then this one actually was designed in a way to catch sediment while you were pouring. A lot of vintage port throws a lot of sediment. And so usually they're decanted, but if it's if it's not too old or you you feel like, oh, I don't really want to decant it, we don't want time, or I don't have a decanter, then that little bulb in the neck would help catch some of the sediment as you poured. Um, I think it's it's fascinating. If you ever if you've never seen it, you should look up videos, or if you if you get a chance to see port tongs, it's a pretty interesting thing. You can decant port. Um, you should decant a uh, vintage port because of the sediment, but a lot of times the cork is so, it's so old because you can drink port from 100, 150 years ago. And so the cork is, is, is nasty and you, there's no way to get a wine key in there to get it out. So what they'll do is they'll use port tongs, which is um, these huge iron tongs that they, they hold over a burner or in a fire for a long time so it's really hot. You put the hot tongs on the neck right below the cork, um, hold it there for a couple minutes, and then put a cold, ice cold cloth, or you can brush it with ice cold water, and the glass will sever cleanly, and, and, and you can take the whole thing off. Uh, and then it's usually filtered through muslin or, or something else so that oh. you can catch any sediment or, um, or if there is glass. I'm supposed to get. <laughs> but yeah, it is, it's, it's insane. Um, I've, I've never seen it in person, but I've seen videos of port tongs. They're on YouTube, it's, it's fun to watch. Um, and then we have ice wine and dessert wine bottles. Um, these are your really tall, thin, skinny um, bottles. They're usually half bottle sizes or smaller because dessert wine is so coyly sweet. You don't want to have a lot of it, maybe just an ounce and a half or two ounces at a time. Um, it's meant to show the elegance and rarity of these special ice wines. And most, most often they're clear because you want to see these really pretty colors, especially some of these Cab Franc ice wines uh, from Canada, like Inniskillen. Um, so these are those pictures. You can see the sandman and wares have that little bulge in the neck. That's sort of your classic port style bottle. And then these are some ice wine bottles. Again, you can see some of them have that high shoulder, kind of like a Bordeaux. Some are a little more sloped, maybe like a, Re a Riesling glass. Um, a lot of times that's because that's an ice wine made from Riesling or the high sloped one is Cab Franc. So it's a Bordeaux variety. So they still kind of will keep those regional um, uh, flares. And then a couple of rare fancy bottles you might have heard of. Um, Clavelin, which is an interesting little bottle from uh, Jura. Uh, it's specifically used for Van Jone or yellow wine. It's a, it's a similar wine to Sherry. It's an oxidative style wine. It's not fortified, but it has a lot of those same nutty flavors. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting size because it's always 620 milliliters. So you, you think about 750 is your standard bottle. A half bottle is 375. 620, like what's the reason? There's not really a reason. They do think that it's because 
in the aging of Van Jones, you lose a lot of liquid, and they they thought that that 620 milliliters was proportioned to the amount of liquid you lost from a standard size bottle in the barrel as it ages under floor. And Clavelin, it's just named after the Abbot Clavelin. So, you know, one of the monks way back when that did everything. Um, Fiasco might be familiar. This is your Chianti bottles with the basket. Um, it's, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, well, it's not fancy wine. That's okay. It doesn't need to be fancy wine. I think it's fascinating because like, um, like our glass blowers who that the burgundy style shape was the easiest to blow the other part of a bottle that's easiest to blow is to have a round bottom it's hard to have that flat bottom if you're just blowing glass and so chianti bottles were usually round at the bottom and so they'd need that basket to stay upright to, to keep them sturdy um and so that's that's why they they invented the fiasco um and then box boil i kind of i mentioned this uh was the last week or, or recently which were these like pot bellied squat flat bottles. I think I showed a picture of it um, that are popular in Franconia. Oh yeah, because we were drinking Silvaner. So a lot of Silvaner is is, is bottled in Boxbeutel in Germany. Um, there's a, a few other appellations or places that can bottle in like uh, Portugal, Italy, and Greece can actually officially use Boxbeutel. It is a protected name and shape by the EU. Um, so you can't go about using it if you're not in Franken or some of these other countries, which is kind of interesting. Um, but these are modeled after sort of canteen, that canteen style. And that's what's in the middle there. So you have your clavelin on the left, um, that Van Jone. You have your box boitel in the middle, sporting some, some looks like cabinet Riesling from Franken, and then the fiasco on the right. What's with the punt? So the punt, this is the dimple on the bottom of a bottle. There's a lot of, this is one of those other things that I tried to fact check right ahead of time to try to see like, why does it actually exist? What's the point? And this is one where no one can agree why it exists. <laughs> so these are some of the, the options of, of what it's all about. Um, what they do think is that it is a historical remnant from blown glass so that when you, if you do try to have that flat bottom, that a punt mark or this little notch is usually left from blown glass um, and in order to prevent that from scratching a table or making the bottle unstable, they would push it in, so they would dimple it up so that you could have a bottle um, just rest flatly on its end um, and, and not have to, to, to wobble or, or fall over. Um, there's some people think it was built that way to help consolidate sediments around the bottle into a tight ring to sort of compact it. Um, people think it could just provide grip for riddling champagne bottles, how they would hand riddle um, to enduring second, secondary fermentation. Um, it, it can make the bottle stronger. It prevents bottle from resonating easily. So it decreases the chance it can shatter. Um, it can allow the bottles to be stacked end to end. I honestly think it's most likely that it's the first one. And that's the one I've heard the most from other, from master sommeliers and people I've, I've studied with is that it's, it's intentionally done so that you have a flat bottom so that there's no concave uh, part of the bottle. Now, lastly, we're just going to talk about storage real quick. So proper storage of, bo of wine bottles before you open it. Um, the main things you should be looking at is temperature, uh, position, light, vibration, and humidity. So proper temperature for wine should be around 55 degrees, but it can definitely range. You don't want to freeze your wine, and you also don't want the wine to get too warm. Um, if, if possible, even if it's kept at 68 degrees and it's a little too warm, as long as it stays stable there, um, it'll help the wine stay aging appropriately. It won't age prematurely. Um, it won't uh, cause the cork to expand and contract because it's really that, that ebb and flow of, of temperature that can cause the cork to malfunction. Um, there's a big debate, not debate, but I've heard conflicting reports about whether you should always age your wine sideways, every style, whether it's champagne or still wine. Um, honestly, if it has cork, it should be stored on its side or upside down. I've said upside down because if you buy a case of wine, a lot of times the way it's bottled, we bottled a bunch of bottles today and you want the bottles to be upside down. And the reason is just, you want to keep the cork moist the entire time and that'll keep it expanded. It'll keep it airtight um, so that you're not the cork doesn't dry out, letting more oxygen in, which can develop the wine sooner than you want it to. Um, people think that champagne should be stored upright because um, it's a pressurized cork and has a cage, so you don't have to necessarily worry about the cork drying out. There's some truth in that, but honestly, it's 
is more about just convenience. If your whole cellar or if all of your wine is on its side, champagne could be on its side. It's not bad for it. Uh, and the same with dessert wines. I've heard some people say dessert wines, really sweet wines can affect the cork in a weird way where you maybe you don't want them touching the cork. But honestly, if it's a cork, it should be on its side. Um, we talked about light earlier, about UV rays, um, but uh, wine is very sensitive to light. So you wanna make sure that you're keeping it um, away from light if you can. Um, definitely away from fluorescent light as well. Um, you, um, LED light is great for, for wine because it doesn't emit as many um, strong rays that can, that can affect those, the chemical uh, process, the, the sulfur compounds. Um, so LED light, light's great, fluorescence is not great, obviously sunlight is not great. Um, the, the different glass colors, the green glass or clear glass, if you have your wine in direct sunlight for three hours, the wine is ruined um, because the amount of UV rays that can get in there. With green colored glass, it's pretty, it's good up to 18 hours. Um, if, if it sees light, it's not gonna affect it because the green filters out enough. And then again, amber or brown colored glass, light's not gonna penetrate that, so it won't affect it. Um, but the other thing is vibration. So vibrations can cause um, other chemical reactions in wine that can decrease tartaric acid, it can reduce esters, it can dull flavors. This is why, you know, I always tell people not to, to put wine like on top of a refrigerator, because um, the refrigerator, the way that the fridge hums or, or vibrates can be an issue. Or, you know, it's hard if you, if you live next to train tracks or something else where you might have vibrations. You just want to be careful that um, if wine, maybe if it's been vibrating, pop it open and drink it. Don't age it any longer. <laughs> Um, and then humidity is the last thing. Again, for cork purposes, you want to keep the cork, uh, you want to prevent it from drying out. So aim for between 60 to 68% uh, humidity. And then after you open it, this is the fun part. The best methods for how to store wine after you open it is not to. You should just drink the whole bottle. That's why I have a half bottle here. I won't feel bad if I finish the whole thing. Um, this is one thing I actually wanted to show you. This is a little trick. So. The other good thing you should do is just pop the cork back in. This is a natural cork. And you'll, you'll see that there's the, the wine side and then there's the side that didn't have wine. There was just a foil on top. Um, a lot of times because of pressure and everything, when you take the cork out initially, the, the top part is gonna be smaller. It'll be easier to stick back in if you wanna put the, the cork back in the bottle. You should really try not to do that whenever you can. Whenever you put a cork back in the bottle, you want to put the, the side that already has seen the wine. It's already been exposed to the wine the whole time. You don't really know what's gone on on this side. A lot of times there could be little bacteria or whatever, or just dust or, or, or grime from, from aging. Um, so you want to try to stick it in back the way that it came. If you, there is a little trick too, if you've never, if you have one of the ones that's, that's hard to get back in, um, you basically put it at an angle you pinch as much as you can and then use your thumb to just push and twist and you push and twist and you can twist it in into back into the bottle um it's obvious it's something you you'd want to try a bunch of times but but i definitely just recommend doing that whenever you recork a wine try to recork it the way it came out so pop the cork back in um and then the best thing you can do honestly if you're if you're not going to finish the wine in that sitting is put it in the fridge put it in the refrigerator um, and even red wine can go in the fridge um, the if as the temperature goes down it's going to prevent oxidation and other things from happening to, to age the wine so um, wine both red and white can be good up for to up to five days in the fridge um, when you do want to re-drink the wine if you're going to open it the next day just take it if you don't like cold red wine especially if it's a, a, a super tannic variety that might taste more tannic because it's cold just take it out half an hour before you want to drink it or put it through an aerator swirl it around it'll still be delicious um there's a couple other gadgets you can get if you if you um, are familiar with the coravan it's a thing where you can put a needle through a cork without opening it and it steals some of the wine out and replaces it with argon gas that's a way to try different wines without having to completely open the wine and it can stay um fresher for a little bit longer there's certain vacuum pumps with rubber stops, stoppers you can get if you want to save wine. You can get argon gas canisters and really just spray some argon and cork it real quick and that'll help prevent oxidation. Uh, and then there's, a, I've heard this one people that um, if you drink 
like if I keep this half bottle or if I get a half bottle with a screw cap, if you want to drink a half bottle, like you open a, a standard size bottle, but only drink two glasses out of it, pour it into a clean half bottle, screw cap it. And the fact that there's a lot less oxygen there will actually keep the wine longer. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. But honestly, I think the best way to store wine is in your belly. And at the end of the day, that's, that's always going to be the most fun thing. So I know that was quite a long presentation, <laughs> but um, which is fine because I didn't think I there was that much to learn about bottles, but oh boy, there was. So, um, so yeah, that is that's some wine bottles. Now, did anyone did, were there any questions or things pop up where you're like that doesn't sound right or I still don't understand that? Now would be your time to to ask a question. Yeah, hey Peter. Yes, hi. Uh, a really uh, curious mind want to know question here. Uh, why 750 milliliters? Oh, this is a great, I actually did learn this and I think this is fascinating. So um, it, it was because it was the Burgundy region that created that, that size bottle first, at least that's, that's, it became standard after the Burgundians made that sloped shoulder bottle. They actually say that um, because they were blown, it was blown glass, that 750 milliliters equaled the amount of air that the human lungs could express in one, uh, in one blow. And so that became the standard size because that's apparently, this, that's the, this is the, the, the legend, is that that's exactly the exact amount that the human lungs could blow into. And so that became the standard bottle. So Okay. Yeah. Um, I think there's probably some other explanations as far as shipping you know like numbers and shipping but um mm. that's, the, that's the reason i liked the best so yeah yeah thank you <laughs> yeah yeah it sounds to me like that when you open a bottle of wine you really ought to drink it all i do i do believe that that's a, a great way to go about it you know and I, I i understand too a lot of times if if you're if you're single or if there's no one else to help you drink a bottle a whole bottle can be quite an undertaking so it, it makes sense that it, it's not always going to be the way to go about it. Um, but, but that's why, honestly, I think if you have access to fridge space and you can just uh, put, put your wine in the fridge at the end of the day, then that's, that's as good as you can do. So, Oh, we have a, a chat question. It was interesting to hear about the vibrations. I never thought about that. My favorite wine shop in Boston was underground next to the State Street Tea Station. Yeah, so that's, um, uh, I'm assuming this is Ivy. Hello. Um, this it's it's funny because I get really nervous sometimes when I visit stores um, and and notice that they're right next to a like a train <laughs> next to a train station or or something else that would just cause a lot of vibrations like traffic highways. Um, we actually had um, an issue. There was a distributor in Seattle that had a bunch of their wine go. Um, um, they had they they had to get an insurance. Um, claim or whatever because their wine was damaged because an Amtrak station was being built right next to their warehouse. Uh, and so the, just the vibrations from construction uh, damaged the wine enough that they couldn't sell it anymore. Um, one thing I will say this, um, both with, with vibrations, but I think it is something, when, now that you know, you know temperature that wine should be stored at, the kind of light exposure, um, next time you're in your local wine store or if you buy wine from a grocery store or wherever you, you get your wine, take a look around and sort of see how it's stored. Because a lot of times I've walked into wine stores before and, and they have a bunch of wine right along the window and it gets a lot of sunlight. And, and I'm just, I'm, it makes, it breaks my heart because I think some of that wine is just going to be less than ideal. It's not going to be as optimal because it, it ages prematurely. And, and totally, feel, you know, always ask and say, oh, you know, are you worried that wine could be, um, damage from sunlight or, or, you know, from vibrations and, and see what the owner says. Cause sometimes they might just not know, and it would be a good thing to bring up so that, um, at the end of the day, we all want the wine to be as good as it can be. So, so that was one thing I, I thought about. Did you say that the Pinot Gris was in, uh, I forget which bottle. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if there was a difference between, and I may, I just may be showing my lack of knowledge between like an American Pinot Gris or a, you know, European Pinot Gris. Uh, can, what's yeah. the difference there? So that's a great question. Um, 
Um, so Pinot Gris, especially with Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio, because they are the same grape. Um, Pinot Grigio is just the Italian name. Pinot Gris is the French name. Um, but it's interesting with bottles because a lot of producers will actually choose like and, and think, let's think about Oregon because Pinot Gris is, is, is grown in Oregon and there's some really great examples of it. And I've seen that producers will choose to either bottle their Pinot Gris in a Burgundy style bottle um, if it's if it's dry or they'll bottle it in a Alsatian style bottle because because typ typically Alsatian Pinot Gris has a little residual sugar. It's it's the part of the style of Pinot Gris in Alsace is it has just a, that sweetness. And so there are producers in Oregon that make an Alsatian style Pinot Gris and they put it in an Alsatian style bottle. And so as a consumer, it might be a way to, to think like, oh, that's actually a, you know, that might have some sweetness or, or I can see that they're trying to do the the Alsatian style Pinot Gris as opposed to a Burgundy style Pinot Gris. Pinot Grigio, most Pinot Grigios I've seen are in Burgundy or Bordeaux style bottles, so the high shoulder. Um, and I'll have to look up, I'm not sure if there's um, an official reason for that um, with Northern Italian Pinot Grigio producers, um, or if it's, because I, I, I've had Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio that's in uh, Burgundy style bottles from Italy. Okay. Also. The bulk of them are, are Bordeaux. But yeah, there are oh, um, the there, another example is Shiraz Pinot. and Shiraz. Um, so in Australia, you know, Syrah and Shiraz, again, same grape, but Syrah is usually is grown in Northern Rhone and in America and other places. They call it Shiraz in South Africa and Australia. But in Australia, you'll have producers, because um, a lot of Shiraz in Barossa, um, are high shoulder bottles. If you think of Penfolds, like Penfolds is a very famous um, uh, producer of Shiraz and it's in the high shoulder and that's kind of become this iconic Australian Shiraz. And so when I think of Australian Shiraz, I usually picture it in a high shouldered Bordeaux style bottle. But now there's also producers in Victoria and other parts of Australia that are both labeling their Shiraz as Syrah and putting it in a Rhone style bottle to signify that it's going to be a Rhone style Syrah. So it's going to be maybe co-fermented with Viognier and just a little leaner. Maybe it's a little more uh, more acid. It won't be as raisinated or as big as some of the other Australian style Shirazes. So, um, so yeah. That's um, helpful. Yeah. That's that's really interesting. The differences. That's great. Thanks. Um, questions: Should I store my extra wine in a mason jar in the fridge? I think that's a great idea, Jan. Um, and especially, I think the important part there is if you can get whatever glass container as close to the amount of wine you have left. So like if you have, you know, 12 ounces of wine left and you have a 12 ounce jar, put it in that 12 ounce jar. Cause like, cause all you're trying to do is you're trying to prevent any sort of space or oxygen. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm all about putting it into a, a different vessel. I would say though, you'd still want to probably drink it the next day or next couple days. Um, and part of it is just cause you, if, if there is any residual, you know, thing that was on the Mason jar, like you want to make sure it's a super sterile, clean jar, um, just so it doesn't mess with the wine in any way. But absolutely. I think storing extra or storing leftover wine in Mason jars. Why not? It's a great idea. So cool. Well, we're we're getting to that time. I know the presentation took a long time. It's all because that that Star Wars movie at the Glass Factory, but um, but I hope you enjoyed it. Next week uh, we're gonna finally have a guest star. Our winemaker Chris Peterson is gonna be here. Uh, we are going to be releasing our new um, Bordeaux variety or our Bordeaux blends, Valerie and Sestina, next weekend so on March sixth. So this, this next Thursday, a couple days before, Chris is going to come on and we're going to taste some library vintages of those wines, uh, sort of in celebration of the release, but also in order to talk about how wine ages, what happens when it ages, what happens to the color, to the taste, aroma, and everything, and for us just to sort of geek out and get to try some of his wines that he made, you know, eight years ago. So um, if you have, you know, it's it's... I don't expect anyone or anyone to have the 2013 Valerie or 2013 Sistina, the ones that we'll be drinking. If you do, that's great. Um, if not, though, if you have any sort of wine that has some uh, age on it, go ahead and grab it. So any anything I think older than five years, you can 
see a little difference. If you have something seven years or 10 years old, that's even better because you can notice more, more difference in, in how it might taste. Um, if you don't, that's fine. Have a youthful wine, have a, a fresh wine too, because then we can have something to compare and contrast. Um, but that should be fun. It'll, it'll be fun to get Chris on onto all things Avenia so you can see, hear from the, the winemaker himself. So cool. Well, thanks again. If you wanted to unmute to say goodbye, I always like finishing with a little send off there and then I will see you in another week. Thank thanks, you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you. Great. Bye. Bye. -bye.